Greetings. Welcome to worship on the sixth Sunday of Easter, a day in which we will consider the commandment Jesus gave his disciples just before he was crucified, a commandment that is simple but not easy, a commandment intended for us too. My name is Marie Duquette and I'm the lead pastor at King of Kings Lutheran Church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Be Lifted is our online worship experience, which will be more complete because of your presence with us today. Now, let us take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Holy God, source of living water, all life flows out from you. In this time of uncertainty with a future unknown, let us give thanks to our God who is always with us. In the days of chaos, your voice moved over the water and life sprang forth. In the days of the flood, you kept Noah and his family safe from harm. In the days of fleeing Egypt, you separated the sea so your people could pass. In the days of wandering in the wilderness, you made water flow from a rock. Holy God, source of living water, all life flows out from you. We praise you for the gift of baptism that binds us to one another and to you. We are united through these waters, the waters that run from this church through our homes, through your beautiful creation. Holy God, source of living water, all life flows out from you. As we play with this precious water. Remind us of who we are, your beloved children. Help us see each person as a member of your body. Ease our anxieties and strengthen our resolve to care for each other. Deepen our faith. Holy God, source of living water, all life flows out from you.
Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Holy God, your promise is simple. In turning from empire's ways, in casting our lot with love, we abide in you. Deepen our understanding that we may trust and believe that this is enough for transformation, for comfort, for building the world we desire. This we pray in the name of our Creator who knew us in the womb, our Redeemer who came to live among us and taught us to love, and our Sustainer, God's Holy Spirit, who walks with us still today. Amen. The first reading is from Acts 10, 44 through 48. While Peter shares the good news of Jesus with a Gentile soldier and his family, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Recognizing that the Spirit works inclusively in the lives of both Jews and Gentiles, Peter commands that these Gentiles also be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Hi there, Tiny Mouse. I don't recognize that melody. It's kind of catchy, though. Hi, Giraffe. I'm singing a new song. I read Psalm 98 this week. It says that we should sing to the Lord a new song. So that's what I'm doing. I guess maybe God is getting tired of the old songs. Uh-huh. Does your song have any words? Not yet. But Psalm 98 says that the rivers should clap their hands and the mountains should sing together for joy. Singing mountains? I bet they would be really loud. Yeah. I don't even know what clapping rivers would sound like. All the rivers I heard just went burble, burble. Maybe that's what clapping rivers sound like. Well, okay. But if the mountains ever start to sing, let me know so I can put on my earmuffs. My tiny ears don't like loud noises very much. You'll be the first one I tell, okay. because I care about you and your ears. Mm -hmm. You know, tiny mouse, Jesus said that we should love one another as he loved us. Isn't that nice? And Jesus also said that we should go and bear fruit that will last. Bear fruit? Wouldn't bear fruit be covered in fur? Oh, I hear you. Funny joke there, mousy comedian. I know what that bearing fruit thing really means. What's that? It means to do good in the world just to read about it or talk about it. You gotta walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And sing new songs, even if they don't have words. Go! Pick it up. Shout with joy to the Lord, are you Shout there? with joy to the Lord, are you Shout there? with joy to the Lord, are you there? Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. With his right hand and his holy arm, as he won for himself the victory, the Lord has made known his victory. His righteousness has he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He remembers his mercy 
and faithfulness to the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, oh you Shout lands. with joy to the Lord, oh you Shout lands. with joy to, to the, the Lord. Lord. Joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea make a noise, and all that is in it, the lands and those who dwell therein. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you Shout lands. with joy to the Lord, all you Shout lands. with joy to, to the Lord. Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 9. Glory to you, o Lord. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. A few years ago, Chase, my 26-year-old son, said to me, Mom, when are you going to write your memoirs? It's what you call a flattering and provocative question. Imagine one of your beloveds saying this to you, write down your story so I can have it. 
As you might well know, I was off for the last month as part of my mini sabbatical. I began taking a memoir class through Stanford University in California online. This memoir class is called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. It's being taught by John W. Evans, an author of two memoirs himself. The first memoir he wrote is called Young Widower. In it, he tells the story of a vacation in Romania that he took with his new wife while they were both serving in the Peace Corps. They were hiking at dusk in the Carpathian Mountains, about 75 miles north of Bucharest, on their way to the hostel in which they would stay for the night. The group of six split into two, with he and his wife each leading half. His group made it to the hostel first. Soon after, two members from his wife group came running into the hostel screaming, one bleeding. Evans immediately ran outside towards the path, shouting his wife's name. He writes, it was then that I heard Katie's voice and swung my flashlight around. I saw nothing, but I heard her. Don't come closer. Find a gun. Get back quickly. Later, he writes, then I was arguing with the hostel owner. He had a rifle, he explained, but he could not let me take it. He would be fined 40,000 Romanian lire for a gun without a state permit to do so. All of the guests were witnesses, he said. His business would be ruined. Ultimately, he returned to the ridge without the gun, in time to watch as the bear mauled Katie to death. He was 29 years old. Evans wrote this about his book. Beyond the attack itself, young widower spends far more time with the events of our ambitious life together. Peace Corps volunteers in Bangladesh, teachers in Chicago, graduate students in Miami, public health work in Romania, my own fragile sense of recovery, and the year of living with Katie's family in Indiana after her death. And yet, for all of the reflection that Young Widower undertakes, from its intimate portrait of affection and marriage, to my guilt and self-incriminations at not having saved her, to the affections and frustrations of trying to grieve with other people, readers seem drawn to the book first because of that violent occasion. Come for the bear attack, I think, but please stay for the honesty, heartbreak, candor, messiness, love, sorrow, and absence, as well as the arbitrariness of a natural world that, for us at least, seemed to lack all reason. In terms of recent memoirs, perhaps you heard about or read one of these. In 2016, Trevor Noah wrote Born a Crime in which he describes his unlikely path from apartheid South Africa to the desk of The Daily Show, which began with a legit criminal act, namely his birth. In 2018, Michelle Obama's Becoming was published. It is the deeply personal reckoning of a woman of soul and substance who has steadily defied expectation and whose story has inspired many women to do the same. And in 2020, Chastin Buttigieg, husband to the new U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, wrote, I have something to tell you, in which he opens up about his life growing up in rural Michigan and how he's healed after coming out to the world. People write memoirs for different reasons. Some are intentionally leaving a written legacy in the event it might be useful to those who come after them, especially those they call family, either by blood or by choice. And some contain both hard-won wisdom and direction. In this sense, you might call the Gospels a kind of memoir, because while they weren't written by Jesus, he certainly provided the content. That content was gathered by his disciples, those who followed him, 
those he had healed, those he had taught, those he, who heard about his healings, his teachings. The stories were told over and over again until finally beginning with the Gospel of Mark about 60 to 70 years after Jesus had died, the Gospel writers finally decided to write the story down so it wouldn't be lost over time. Some people wonder why it took so long for the Gospel writers to get started. The most common reason is that Jesus said he was coming back. And his disciples took that to mean right back. When Jesus said he was going to prepare a place for them, his disciples thought he had to get a few groceries, maybe change the bedding. They didn't realize Jesus right back meant mm, at least a couple millennia. And yet today's gospel reading still has a sense of urgency to it, like one might find in a late-in-life memoir written today. The setting is Thursday of Holy Week. Jesus is lounging after supper with his disciples. He's just been talking to them about vines, branches, and abiding. Judas has gone to the Empire Police, whose charge was to carry out the madness of Caesar. And those obedient government officials are on their way to the garden to arrest Jesus. Jesus doesn't really have the time to take a memoir class and craft several hundred pages to leave behind, but he did leave behind a few pages, including the words we heard today. Right before Jesus is arrested, he used that precious time to say just a few key things that were written down much later. I want to look at four of them now. Love one another. We hear it so much it hardly moves us at all anymore. We assume we are loving one another, the best we can anyway, most of the time. Or maybe we know we aren't doing so good at loving one another, not with everyone. How could we? And Lord knows there's a lot of reasons why we love less than the commandment intended. And if we each struggled with the ways we succeed and fail at love, and we did it in writing, that would be a memoir. But I think it's safe to say, regardless of how well we carry out this commandment, we'd be hard-pressed to say we didn't hear about it. And frankly, I could easily list as many ways that I see people love one another as I see them do anything but. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This one is always a little disturbing, right? I mean, if your first reaction when you hear this is something inside you that says, of course, he's not talking literally here, well, you wouldn't be the only one who thinks that, and Fun fact, this is a place where he is being literal simply because real abiding love is often sacrificial. And of course, he's, off, he's also talking about what he's about to do. But the fact that he's going to go first in practicing this lay down your life part doesn't really make it less anxiety producing when we dare to really think about it, now does it? And yet, people lay down their lives for others literally every single day. Real love pushes people to take risks and do what they think they cannot do for the sake of loving one another. If you have read some of the COVID obituaries from ordinary people who died in the last year, you'll see that. Teachers, doctors, nurses, bus drivers, coaches, counselors, family, friends, chefs, chefs who fed people who had lost their jobs for free right up until they were hospitalized and could no longer do so. All of these lived this commandment, love one another, 
ultimately laying down their lives. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. At first when I read this one, I thought, oh, come on. We just got the servant part down. We've sung the servant hymn, even though the melody reminds us of Kermit singing Rainbow Connection. Being servants of the God Most High is part of our identity. We know that if we want to be great in God's kingdom, we have to be the servant of all. We understand, and to those who much is given, much is expected. What about the feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting those in prison? That sure sounds like serving to me. I don't know. Maybe it's because social media has reduced the word friend to something that applies to your second cousin, with whom you agree about absolutely nothing. That this new descriptor, friend, feels like a demotion. And yet, upon further thought, I confess that friend also suggests mutuality, a kind of intimacy. A friend is someone you can call at 3 a.m. with or without a good reason. A friend suggests we are on the inside, at least we know the plan. Servant suggests a hierarchy. And given the systems of this world that are supported by iron-clad hierarchies, it is easy to believe Jesus wanted to leave us with the image of friend rather than solely servant. I mean, think about it. Caesar had no friends, only subordinates, people who were loyal to him. And to love implies a lack of hierarchy, subjugation, or coercion. Jesus called his disciples friends. And the last one, you did not choose me, but I chose you. New Testament scholar Caroline Lewis explains this verse this way. I chose you is not something we should base theological systems and church doctrine upon. It is a heartfelt reminder to a group of friends who are about to suffer much loss and be in mourning. Jesus is saying, you are here with me. Now is not the time to wonder whether or not you should be here, are meant to be here, are worthy to be here. This might be a way to paraphrase what is behind this assurance here and now. In other words, the language of choice is the language of promise in this moment of loss and fear rather than theological doctrine justifying systems of confessions. Maybe given the situation in which Jesus says all of this, while the sky becomes darker, the winds kick up, and determined, measured, multiple footsteps can be heard coming closer Maybe Jesus calling them friends was akin to saying, I got you. In these few words, I chose you. Just after he calls his disciples friends, he is saying, it's going to be hard, really hard. You will miss me. You will feel adrift. You will mourn many people for much of your lives. You will wonder at times what you could have done to prevent tragedies from unfolding. When this happens, remember, I chose you, I got you. Maybe when we look at the violence in our world, the extent of hunger, the number of refugees, the systems of power that continue to oppress, imprison, and kill those who reject the corruption that tears apart lives of good people 
who are trying to do the right thing and love one another, we too might remember this. Maybe when we feel unable to tackle injustices that are the bread and butter of the Caesars and Pilots and Herods in power today, we could take some comfort in hearing Jesus saying this to us. I got you. When you feel like you are failing, I got you. When you feel like you have let God down, or even when you find it hard to love or forgive yourself, Jesus says, I got you. Maybe in this spoken memoir Jesus left for his disciples then, and his disciples all these years later, and all of those in between, Jesus wanted to be sure we remembered that loving one another is the only lasting way, that his love is the model to follow, and that he chose disciples just like us who would get it wrong as often as they got it right and named them friends. Maybe he said these things so that in the year 2021, when we were trying to think and plan, vote and protest and love our way out of violent, corrupt systems of which we have been used as pawns, we might remember these words from our Savior about the real cost of loving one another, that is, to lay down our very lives. Maybe we will remember Jesus calling us friends, reminding us that he chose us, and in these words, find hope, find peace. Because the rest of the context for today's gospel was that soon Jesus would be crucified, an act of unjust violence and death that three days later would give way to resurrection new life, and a whole new beginning for his disciples and for the world. I want to close with a quote from my memoir professor, John Evans' second memoir, entitled, Should I Still Wish?, in which he writes about his second marriage, also to a Peace Corps volunteer named Kate and his struggle with survivor's guilt as he tries to live into this new life, which today, 13 years later, includes three young sons. He closes this memoir with these words. I can only look to the future a few moments at a time. When I'm lucky, a whole afternoon. The world is changing too fast ever to really begin or end. But when I try to slow it down enough to hold the moment in my affection, always it seems I am looking at the next beginning. <laughs>
alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and to answer in steadfast love. Loving God, you call us to be your fruit-bearing church. Strengthen the bonds among all Christian churches. Today, we pray for the Moravian Church, giving thanks for the life and witness of Nikolaus Ludwig von Zinzendorf, renewer of the church and hymn writer. As you have loved us, let us love one another. Creating God, the earth praises you. The seas roar and the hills sing for joy. So fill the earth with your love that by their song all creatures of land and sea and sky burrowing and soaring may call us to join them in your praise. As you have loved us, let us love your creation. Faithful Savior, you conquer the world not with weapons, but with undying love. Plant your word in the hearts of the nation's leaders and give them your spirit so that the peoples of the world may live in peace. As you have loved us, let us love one another. Caring healer, you forget no one. You accompany the lonely. Be present with those who are sick or suffering, including Al, Pam's sister, Tammy, Harold, Chris's friend, Soam, and all those whom we name in our hearts. Provide for those needing homes or medical care. We remember the 1.3 billion citizens of India. And point us, Lord, toward life-giving responses to those needs in our own communities. Especially in this month, where we bear in mind the National Alliance for Mental Illness make us both mindful and helpful for those struggling with mental illness of any kind. Be with the dying, including those whom we name in our hearts. As you have loved us, let us love one another. Gracious God, as a mother comforts her child, you comfort us. Bless mothers and mothering people in our lives. Comfort those who miss their mothers. Comfort mothers who grieve. Comfort those who grieve because they cannot be mothers. And comfort those who have never known a loving mother. As you have loved us, let us love one another. Gentle Redeemer, all who die in you abide in your presence forever. We remember with thanksgiving those who shared your love throughout their lives, especially Jim Pagels, 
a U of M grad student killed in a bicycle accident last month. Keep us united with them in your lasting love. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of our risen Christ be with you always. At this time, we invite you to participate in our ministries of feeding the hungry, welcoming the immigrant, working for justice, and affirming love between all people. To do so, go to kingofkingslutheran.org and on the home screen at the top, click the button that says Ways to Give. If you'd like to give directly to Fed Up Ministries, go to fedupministries.org and simply click Give at the top of the screen. Thank you so much for your continued support and generosity for our ministry here at King of Kings Lutheran Church. We are humbled and strengthened by the ways that you participate in God's work in this world. Let us pray. Beloved one, in bringing our offerings together, we ask your blessing on this community. We know there is nothing more precious, more powerful, more persistent than the gifts of your love. May we be committed to sharing it materially, spiritually, and relationally in all aspects of our life. Amen. Let us not be deceived. To cast our lot with love is a serious thing. Though some have called love weak, such is a shallow understanding. Love is power. Love is solidarity. Love is freedom, defiant and emerging with courage. We are sent to practice love by the one who raises life from death. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thank you. 